Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about The Silence of Unworthy Gods by Andrew Rowe. So this is the fourth book in the Arcane Ascension series. I really dig this series. It's a lot of fun because it's purely about, well not purely, but it's a classic like magic school system, kind of like Harry Potter in a lot of ways. But apart from that, there is of course a plot and everything, but apart from that, the major emphasis is on exploration of the magic system and the way the magic works. And I am a huge world building fan and magic system fan, so I really, really got into this series a lot. So I want to go ahead and talk about this one today. We're going to talk probably a little bit of non-spoiler, then go into some spoilers and make sure you leave me a comment, let me know what you think about it, if you've read it or if you haven't, or if you're interested in reading it after I talk about it. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel though. <laughs> so yeah, let's begin. Alright, so the fourth book of the Arcane Ascension series. So this story is really interesting. To me, this one kind of feels like we're really hitting the stride in the series. Because beforehand, it kind of felt a little sloppy. It felt like um, world building and magic system exploration with a little plot thrown in there, right? It wasn't like, it wasn't balanced. It wasn't the exploration of all this stuff along with a plot. This one to me feels a lot more balanced. We It feels like we have an equal amount of classic plot storyline and character development mixed with exploration of this magic system and deepening the world of the way it works. The book, of course, isn't perfect. There are some issues that I have with the structure. There is some stuff that seems to be very clearly set up like, there's beginning plot points that are started that are meant to parallel the ending, you know, to conclude those plot points, but they're done in such a way that I think they should have been rearranged. So, we'll talk about that more when I talk spoilers. So, let's go ahead and talk about the pacing. The pacing in the story is really well done. It actually kept me really, really engaged all the way throughout because the pacing was so well done. It was less calm and but not hyper breakneck speed. It wasn't like we we're running to a goal. It was really like the sense of a school year like you in the moment you almost feel like man this week is taking forever but when you kind of look back a little bit like dang where'd the whole year go it kind of has that effect but kind of without the this is taking forever kind of thing if that makes any sense it kind of it feels like the the quickness of a school year after you look at it in hindsight that's probably the best way i can describe it um the story continues to be Basically, our main cast, we have Corn, Sarah, Patrick, and um, and Mara, Marissa, and Karis, and Derek. That is kind of our main crew. So in this one, or actually up until this point in the series, we have had Derek and Karis that has essentially been like the guardians of our main group of characters. They have been like the big brothers to them, essentially. In this one, we're kind of trying to take a step back away from that. So we're trying to give all our characters more agency and more independence and basically allow them to be powerful enough to handle all this stuff themselves. So it kind of gives this level of maturity that the previous books didn't have. And we also start to see some proper development of characters like Corrin, who has had like who has a touching aversion mostly because of the abuse he suffered at the hands of his father. So he's very much touch averse and like all this kind of stuff and very much not good with social norms and stuff like that and very confused when it comes to romance and courtship and stuff. But in this one we get a, a it's interesting, it's interesting because like pretty much every character that Corrin has come in contact with that has some sort of romantic interest, we kind of keep it and it kind of keeps going. But in this one there's one situation where it feels like this one option is starting to rise above the others, if that makes any sense. So yeah, that's one of the main things that I noticed that's kind of coming, um, that's kind of making decent progress on. We get more proper development of this character, Corrin, and um, with his understanding of others around him, because that's kind of the crux of the series, is that he's this kind of person that's just not really good at all of the normal person stuff. So we kind of, it's really nice to see him actively get better at it and like working towards um, being a more well-rounded person essentially, all while getting ridiculously powerful. It's just so much fun watching a character get more and more powerful, especially when they do it in unconventional ways. He's not just 
a classic brute force kind of person. He has to use his mind, and those are my favorite kinds of characters. So let's go ahead and jump into spoilers so I can talk in a little bit more detail. I kind of want to talk about the plot structure. So if you've read um, the Arcane Ascension 4, then please continue on. But if you haven't, be warned, there will be spoilers ahead. <laughs> so yeah, let's go ahead and talk some spoilers. In this story, the structure of it is interesting. We start off the book essentially with them coming back from the um, train ride from the third book when they basically they took, they were in between semesters. We got basically summer vacation book, last book. So in this one, they're on their way back. And almost immediately when they get back at the train station, they meet up or are met by Corrin's dad who is really mad at all the stuff he's done and like just being a shithead dad he's just not a good person and he has a misperception of the things that Corrin has been doing and he's taking it all as an insult and nobleman nonsense nonsense so as he's like verbally berating him at the train station is challenging him to a duel and basically threatens Sarah that he won't even acknowledge her as his daughter so she could lose any sort of you know noble type benefit that she has like so it basically becomes this very terrible kind of um, very awkward, very embarrassing kind of public thing. And Corrin is basically able to kind of talk himself out of it a little bit. He's basically able to postpone it because Karis is right there. And Karis is like, I will beat the absolute dog shit out of your dad right now if you want me to. I will rip his face off and slap him with it. <laughs> like, I will do all kinds of crap. So I was all on board. I was like, let him do it, let him do it, let him do it. Like, I was so hyped for it. But it makes so much sense that he didn't because he doesn't want to... It, Corn has a lot of things kind of tied up into it. He doesn't want some, to need someone to rescue him. And he doesn't want to, like, have a half victory by having have to, you know, have someone else take care of his dad to stop the abuse and stuff like that. So he's just got, like, a lot of things built up into it. So he essentially sets it up for at the end of the year. He's like, let me go through the school year and then we'll duel at the end of the year. And he's like, okay, all this stuff. So we have that set up. And the way it's set up in the book, it makes me feel like that's the primary plot point. Like all the magic exploration, all the stuff we're doing is going to kind of lead us way into that situation. And that's how we're going to resolve. And this is going to be kind of a big thing in this book. But there are other plot lines and things that have been set up and are being set up that then also have to get resolved too. But it's done in such a way where it's very much like, okay, this plot, this plot, this plot and this plot and then they're resolved very much like okay we settled this now let's go and settle this now let's settle it's it's overly structured and it feels too procedural to me so at, apart from the dad thing being set up we also learn that um Ch uh, melt lake their professor is now chancellor she's like at a large political position now so she is very famous in her high power level and stuff so she basically wants to help everyone get stronger so that the school can have this great reputation and their country can have a bunch of the attuned, a bunch of magic users who are just really powerful. So she basically lets this secret out that um, basically there is a simple process. Everyone can essentially start a spell and then release the spell before casting it and it reabsorbs the mana back in your body. So it kind of works as a workout and it helps them get stronger. So that's something that only the noble houses and the rich people and influential people knew about. So it was basically a way to keep the rich powerful, but everybody else kind of at a medium level. So now that that secret is out, everybody has access to it and people are just jumping levels and stuff and they're getting way more powerful. So the nobles, the young nobles and stuff who benefited from this selective knowledge are really, really pissed off about it. So it basically becomes almost a racism plot line where there's like mild domestic terrorist attacks from these people called the Sons of Valia who are actively attacking low-born or common-born people who are deemed to be too powerful. So they're going after people and stuff and it kind of becomes a situation where Korn has to be told that he is one of the people in a position of power, that he could easily be recruited to the Sons of Valia or attempted recruited at least. Because he is the son of a noble, no matter how their family became noble, he's a noble, he has all those benefits, he has all those privileges and all this other kind of stuff. And he kind of starts to realize, like, oh, so for a good while, the story really becomes a check your privilege storyline, which part of me is like, oh, okay. Like, yes, it needs to be done and it needs to be said and it's actually handled quite nicely in the story. It's not overly preachy or anything like that, but it's just a little too topical right now. It's just... I love fantasy as an escape. I don't want to 
read a book, I mean, read a fiction book, read a fiction fantasy book and essentially be thrown into Twitter arguments or political discourse or something like that. I just, it's not as enjoyable. But the structure of the way it works, like it kind of works because um, it works within the story because the story is obviously made to make it work. So it kind of goes a long way towards Corrin and starting to understand he has privilege and he kind of needs to check that privilege and he needs to use his privilege and his position of power to kind of help other people. So it kind of goes in that way and they're trying to do what they can to help all while Corrin is learning more about his abilities. He's actually outright learning how to manipulate the fundamental structure of what of the things that give them magic abilities so he is he did he does <laughs> there's this one scene in the book that i think is so fun it is so hilarious to me he makes this thing so one of the other characters is a summoner and summoners hold contracts to their monsters so that they can summon them in battle and use them to fight so that requires their magic source their mana to go out of them into the monster and then the magic that the monster has goes from them to that person. So they're constantly recycling their magical energy, essentially, which allows their ability to jump up and pace even faster than the normal person or even faster than the person using those special exercises that were just disclosed to everybody else. So Corrin, being ingenuitive as he is, he basically creates an item using his enchanter's ability that does the same thing without having to have that particular set of abilities. So when he does it and does it successfully and then increases his um, his strength gain like by 30 something percent a weekly, he said, and it kind of it culminates in this situation where he he has the it's a glove and he like has it and realizes how much stronger he is and stuff. And then he goes off to go tell one of the other characters. He's like, um, I think I broke society. <laughs> like, I thought it was so hilarious because I'm like, yeah, that kind of thing would completely upend all of this. So um, they basically go down this rabbit hole of you have a product that could easily make you a billionaire and it could break society and irreparably change everything. And he was talking about just letting it be free, just letting the plans out there and stuff. And they're like, um, that will make you probably the biggest target for the Sons of Alien. They will come after you and try to kill you. So, apart from that whole thing that's going on, there's another situation where they're basically constantly in fear that one of the god beasts from the spires and stuff is going to come after them. Or someone as a representative of the tyrant in gold. So, one of the cool things about the plot structure that was done, though, that I liked was they kind of mixed those two together. So the Sons of Alia end up working with one of the children of the Tyrant in Gold. So he becomes the basically the face of the, the racism issue, which is, you know, of course, very convenient in the story. They end up distilling it down to an avatar that you can fight and defeat. And therefore, we have defeated this classism issue thing or whatever, which, you know, obviously is not how it works in real life. But fantasy book. But... So let's talk about the way they resolve these plot lines. So the thing I was talking about in the beginning, the plot line with the dad, we get to a point in the story where all this stuff has happened, all this exploration, all this new stuff that's going on. Um, Derek is leaving, Karis is gone, so they've lost their big mentors and stuff. And now we have to basically rely on them to be powerful enough to take care of themselves as the story goes on. But then we end up at the duel and Corrin goes to face his father and he basically manipulates him to such a masterful degree that they end up starting the duel with a handshake. And in the moment when he shakes his hand, Corrin uses his two attunements to basically shut off his dad's power. He does a avatar and just takes his bending away and <laughs> takes all his powers away for like 10 minutes. He puts it on the timer for 10 minutes and it completely shatters his dad's spirit and makes him feel stupid. Basically, he drops to his knees completely defeated and all this stuff and it just, it works in this beautiful way because the solution relied on Korn's strengths, his um, intelligence and his ingenuity and like all of that kind of stuff. So that just worked out beautifully. And then... That, to me, felt like the end of the book. The The very situation that they leave it off on, talking about how he's going to, like, pretty much at the end of it, he was like, and now I'm going to go sleep for, like, three days or whatever. Like, it ended in a perfect way. It felt like the perfect ending to it. Everything culminated. Even the last line was perfect. 
But then there were 10 more chapters, and I was really confused. I was like, isn't this the end? Like, how is this not the end of the book? Like, it, it wasn't, and it was so strange to me. So we then continued to deal with the race, the classism issue. So that basically keeps going and keeps going for another few chapters. We basically set up this thing. Actually, no, before that, there is a final exam in school. So we have to then resolve the school stuff that was going on. We have to finish the semester. So that happens after the duel with the dad, which I, again, find strange. And then after that, they basically immediately get attacked by one of the children of the tyrant in gold as basically a representative of the Sons of Alia, the classism terrorist organization or whatever. And then this, they have, they don't have their protectors. They don't have their, their big guns. They still have Derek at this moment, but even the Emerald level, which is like one of the highest in their structures that, you know, most powerful people just can't do anything. Cause this person that they're fighting is essentially the son of the devil one of the children of their devil or whatever. So everyone just gets absolutely massacred. Sarah almost dies. Um, it Basically, it boils down to Derek ends up having to go and be a servant for this person in order for the person to um, basically stop. After a huge battle, they end up murdering the guy. They end up finally killing him, getting the upper hand and killing him. But there's a bunch of the siblings. So if any of them die another one shows up to kill everybody that had just killed them. So basically in order to get out of that situation, Derek has to agree to be the slave of the sister that shows up to kill all of them. So he gets taken away. And basically in exchange, they save Sarah who almost got her entire chest completely ripped out. Like she's basically at death's door and she was saved last minute, but she's not exactly you know, the same. She's forever changed, much like when she got all the mana scarring. And Corrin has used all of his power. He is wrecked and messed up. And just everybody leaves this book completely disheveled, completely and utterly defeated. So this is very much the Empire Strike Back type ending. So I have an issue with the way the plot was structured, but the way this ended with all this set up and they don't have their bodyguards anymore and they don't have their big bads anymore or anything. Like, I love that because now I'm ready to go forward to see just how truly powerful these four will be and see how much they can handle. And Marissa, their strongest physical fighter, hand-to-hand -hand combatant, lost a hand. Like, so they just are so completely battered and broken at the end of this. And it just, I like that. But now in hindsight, I feel like, you couldn't have had the duel with the dad after that. So now the structure of it kind of feels like um, Andrew Rowe basically had these things. And he's like, eh, I can't not, I just, I guess I could just got to put it like this. But he just kind of ran into like a wall and just kind of had to do it that way. So it affected my enjoyment of it. But I really, really did like this. I didn't care for too much of the, the hyper, you know, topical political stuff in it. But it was handled in a very, very nice way. And it was like sympathetic and it made sense. And to have, it, it almost kind of became a how to teach someone to check their privilege thing. But it was done in a way that wasn't too preachy. So I kind of can appreciate it, but it wasn't as enjoyable as the previous books. But that's kind of mitigated by the deepening of the world building and the magic systems. They have finished their expansion and now they're just getting deeper. So all the exploration of the magic in this one was really the fundamentals of how it all works, which is stuff I really, really like. So I really enjoyed it for that reason. So if you've read The Silence of Unworthy Gods, let me know what you thought about it in the comments down below. Or if, if you read any of the Arcane Ascension series, let me know about your thoughts in the comments down below. So as always, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And I will talk to you all next time. Peace. Thank you.